welcome Mesa Church. Why don't you just give it up one more time for anybody who is here for the very first time. We're grateful for you. you are, uh, you're here on an awesome day. This is the, the second part of a new series on relationships called, does anyone know? Called XO, Built to Last. And uh, is it still going? What's going on? I can't see the screens. Oh, is someone playing? I, I don't know what's going on. I just work here. Um, we're just grateful for you. And uh, so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at a passage today. Uh, but I just, you know, I'm just grateful for you that you're here. Welcome to the table. Everyone has a story. Everyone is welcome. And our hope during this series really is, is just simply to invest in marriages, invest in relationships. Last week we talked about the little foxes that can get into the vineyard and can make a lot of destruction. And that represents those little things, habits, uh, sin that can destroy relationships. And God doesn't want destruction. He wants restoration. He wants human flourishing. He wants your marriage to last. And so super, super grateful for, uh, for just the opportunity this morning to simply read God's word and to be encouraged. So with that said, I want to ask a, a, just a simple question. What good is commitment? What do you do when you don't feel it anymore? Last night I wasn't feeling it. Uh, my, my family and I got uh, this little trailer to take our kids uh, on, a, on a bike ride. How many of you seen those? They, they connect to a beach cruiser. So Tara and I have these beach cruisers. And last week I did, rediscovered how much fun it is to ride bikes with my, my sister and my my uh, brother-in-law, we were riding bikes along the ocean. And so um, we, we got this trailer so that our kids could uh, participate with us. And um, so I got it all set up and got this whole thing ready. And we started uh, on this bike ride and I had a flat tire. So immediately, I mean, I was like, I'm just thinking like, this is exactly how it always goes in my head. You know, like you're excited for something, you're looking forward to something, you buy the thing, you get it set up, you fix the thing, you get it ready, and then all of a sudden you're, you're just, you know, 10 feet in. Come on, how many of you feel like you're married? 10 feet? No, 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 just kidding. And something goes wrong, like, you know, I mean, it just, it's like, ugh. So we pull back to the garage and I take the back tire apart and I, you know, try to, you know, get it back on. And Tara just goes, why don't we just do this tomorrow? Because she could read the frustration on my face. You know, just the disappointment, the frustration, now my hands are dirty, time is ticking, and I'm just, ugh. And my kids who are sitting in the trailer were saying things like, I'm never going to go on a bike ride again, Daddy. This is horrible. And I'm just like, you know, like, I got to do this for my kids. You know what I mean? Like, grit teeth. I'm going to make this tire work. How many know you can't make tires work? It has to. So we got the tube. We switched it out. And we got going again. And then all of a sudden, it was bent. And long story short, after like an hour of tinkering, this non-mechanical, non-engineered type of person, me, got it working. Thank God. And so um, it was so fun, though. We just went around in different places as the sun was setting and ah, it was good it really was good and then we got home and we parked the we parked the bikes and, and my kids had fun and we went to bed and like there was just, there was a, this genuine feeling of joy and fulfillment and the thought popped into my mind this morning um, just 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 in a in a very superficial way what would what would the night have looked like if we just would have called it a night and gone in and not pressed through? I think about Michelangelo and some of the, the masterpieces he created, the Pieta, which is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful pieces of marble sculpted of Mary holding Jesus. It took him two years to sculpt that. I think of the Sistine Chapel, which took five years. And I think of the masterpiece of you. The fact that one in 400 trillion chance that you are here because God chose you to be here. And he has been sculpting and shaping you, using things like marriage and relationships to turn you back into what you originally created for. A perfect reflection of him made in the image of God. What would our lives look like without commitment, 
what wouldn't get finished, what would be sitting in the, in the pieces and the parts and the brokenness of if we didn't see God's commitment to us as a motivation to keep building this life that we know that God's called us to. Last week we looked at Song of Psalm. This week we're going to look at the words of Jesus. But before we actually talk about marriage, I want to talk about Jesus' words themselves. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Man, if you've got a pen today, those, uh, those, verbs, those verbs would be really good to underline. There's not just one of them, there's two. Those who hear these words of mine and those who do these words of mine. It almost sounds like Jesus' little brother got something from his older brother when he wrote the epistle James, right? Faith with wor without works is dead. You got to do something in response. 25, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it what a passage I don't want to miss the next two verses though and when Jesus finished these sayings the crowds were astonished at his teaching he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes where do we get our definitions from this is actually an important conversation in preparation for a conversation about marriage and we launched into a discussion on platforms last week, right? Different ways we learn to believe things. But what is the root or origin of our ethics, our morality, our definitions for things? I love a quote by um, a guy who was a, a writer in the time of, uh, of C.S. Lewis by the name of G.K. Chesterton. He says this, um, art, like morality consists of drawing the line somewhere. I, I love that quote because it reminds me that Christians aren't the only ones drawing lines. Everyone is drawing lines somewhere. If I were to stand up here and tell you that there are moral absolutes, you might push back on where those lines are, but you probably wouldn't push back on a really gruesome example. I'm going to just be as extreme as I possibly can. If I had an infant up here and I had a knife and I was torturing the baby, how many of you would just that's wrong right come on like that would there's no society on the face of this planet that would be okay with that so just that example alone by itself proves that there's something innate in us that just pushes back on this concept of evil well the bible just de defines evil as sin and and the word in the new testament is homartia it just means to miss the mark it draws the line around God and says anything outside of those lines is, is basically not God. It's not right. It's not like him. And everything inside of that line, anything that is like God, is good, right? So regardless of whether you consider yourself a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim or an atheist or agnostic, you have to have a definition of morality. An agnostic or an atheist might say, well, it's just a social contract between people. When in reality, morality comes from one of four places. And this is a conversation, a great book that I would suggest by J.P. Moreland called The God Conversation. He lists the four places. He says, morality will either come from people in power, from culture, from individuals. Right? So think about each of those. People in power. They're the ones that create a sense of right and wrong. Right? So whatever they legislate, that's right and that's wrong. Um, culture, it's just, it's broader than a government, but it's like the culture of America or the culture of Germany in the 1950s, right? Or individuals, people who just decide on their own, like, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is right and this is wrong. The problem with those three is that it doesn't allow humanity to come together about where those moral absolutes are. In fact, when the Holocaust happened, the big struggle at the end of it was, um, what, what are we going to do with all of these war criminals, right? How are we going to judge them? Because we can't judge them um, in terms of their morality because if they're influenced by people in power, which Hitler was in power, we can't, who are we to judge? Their culture had embraced this, this 
uh, and by the way, I am German, like this is part of my background as well, um, their culture had, had allowed this to come in. And, and in an individual level, each person was deciding on their own. Or we could appeal to the law above all laws or God's law. And my question for us this, this morning is important because we can decide where the definitions are for marriage, for sex, for singleness, for divorce. But where would that get us at the end of the day? At the end of the day, a Christian is someone who has um, claimed to be a disciple of Jesus or an apprentice of Jesus, someone who not only hears God's words, but does them, right? Like that's Jesus' own definition from his own teaching about how to build a life. And I've never done marriage counseling for someone who said, I want to I want to I want to build a faulty marriage and a marriage that will be cracked and broken so that when I'm 40 or 50 or 60, it'll all fall apart off the split, all my assets and our kids will have all sorts of no one does that because everyone I know everyone I've ever done counseling for wants to build something solid and good. So why don't we actually commit ourselves to Christ and his teachings? We must commit ourselves to the words of Jesus and to the response that Jesus invites us to. And Jesus says if we do that, it will be like a house built on the rocks. And even when the fields flee, I don't change my behavior. I will press I think this might be one of the most important teachings on life, not just marriage, that Jesus could ever teach us. That feelings don't dictate my future, but the way I cultivate my garden determines the health of my future. The way I decide today determines what I experience tomorrow. So much of our lives are a result of our choices. And I'm convinced that a disciple follows even when the fields are gone that we if we decide on this morning regardless on jesus definition of marriage divorce singleness and all of that it will commit to him in his words that he will finish what he started in us and we don't have to be subject to the forget it i'm done feeling which by the way all of us have those feelings this is what jesus says in matthew 19 3 through 12 i've had a lot of people ask me well, what does jesus talk about uh, in terms of, of what does Jesus say about marriage, sex, divorce, singleness? And a lot of people will say, well, he doesn't really say anything, but they don't read the Bible. We're going to look at what he actually says this morning. So this is what Jesus says about, now context is, is divorce. This is what he says in verse uh, 3 of chapter 19. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by saying, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not heard that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus is obviously responding to uh, the question of divorce. But embedded in this conversation is a definition of marriage, if you couldn't see that. He has a lot to say. And it's not just about marriage, but it's also in reference to sex. It's reference to singleness, and all of it requires commitment. I, uh, I have a toothbrush up here, and just for the sake of it, I just would ask the simple question, how many of you share a toothbrush with anyone? And, and, and I can still kind of see if, can we just get a big hand, like you share a toothbrush with someone, how many of you, anyone? I don't see anyone, right? Like I see people... There's one person. Okay, I'm guessing that's with your kids. You are a very adventurous person. I, wow. There's always one in the crowd. The reality is most of us probably, likely, would not share a toothbrush with someone else. But... We share all sorts of other things in this life. 
that are way more intimate than a toothbrush. So what is it that causes us to have that like response when we don't have that same sense of commitment towards other areas of our life? And let me just be clear. I do not share my toothbrush with even my wife. Come on, can I get an amen? amen. How many of you women or men do not share your toothbrush with your spouse? Because that's disgusting. <laughs> Besides the one person over here who I will have to apologize to later. This is what Jesus says about marriage, that he made marriage between men and women to foster families, right? This actually reminds me, it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, to the beginning before sin entered into the world. God created this beautiful partnership. We talked about this last week. And literally, the body parts of men and women are complementary to create something. And it's not just to create pleasure, or that's a part of it. We're going to talk about the drugs associated with sex. But guess what sex produces? kids. It's crazy. Did you know that sex creates little humans? <laughs> but yet you still won't share your toothbrush with either your spouse or your kids. Jesus on marriage. So he is behind this. God is a part of this. Actually, in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, you see even more clearly God's desire for the family to be the unit that creates a discipleship lifestyle for kids as they grow up and that they would see the modeling of their parents' relationship with each other and more importantly, their relationship with God, and they would see God's faithfulness to them and they would respond by repeating it. Marriage takes a lot of commitment. Jesus on sex. Very clearly in this passage, God makes marriage for sex, but not just sex. Really, the word that I want to focus on is oneness. Oneness. Oneness, of course, represents the physical oneness that happens when a man and a woman come together. But I want you to understand that it's so much bigger than that. That's why people can be having sex, but they aren't intimate. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like the bigger picture of one of oneness, the deeper image of oneness is an emotional and a spiritual coming together. When two people come together, God brings them together and God being a part of that makes it really hard for them to separate. That's why divorce is so difficult on so many people. And to make it really, really hard to get divorced, God hardwires our bodies and our brains for it. I'm going to list a couple of chemicals. Anybody like drugs? It's not one of those trick questions, right? You can actually say, yes, there are some chemicals that I love because they're literally a part of how God created you. And sex brings all of these out, like dopamine. Did you know that in orgasm, this pleasurable neurotransmitter is released and all of a sudden you feel really good? That's why you like to have sex. Oxytocin, the cuddle drug, or the love hormone creates a bond that makes it very difficult to disconnect. This is why we like to have sex. Endorphins, like morphine, they feel good and then they're calming. Ever wonder why you want to go to sleep after sex? Serotonin, an antidepressant, and it helps to regulate moods released during sex. Adrenaline, increased blood flow to your muscles. It, it makes you feel exhilarated. How about, I never say this drug correctly, phenylethylamine, phenylethylamine, <laughs> which also triggers dopamine release into pleasure centers of the brain. And it's found in chocolate, by the way. See how this is all connected? <laughs> There's so many benefits to sex and the physical coming together of a husband and wife. It is literally the glue that God uses to bind a couple together for as long as their life. I thought, how can I encourage our people at Mesa Church to apply this teaching? And then I realized, if I have to explain it to you, I probably shouldn't. There's so many health benefits. You grow brain cells. It protects against dementia by fighting off a shrinking hippocampus caused by depression. It relieves stress. It relieves pain. It's good for the heart. Women who have sex with their spouses have an increase of estrogen. There is a glow about you. God literally designed you to have sex. So, it's pretty incredible that Jesus acknowledges this as 
the thing that God is up to in the middle of two lives coming together to become one. And then he addresses the elephant in the room, which was the argument between the teachers of the law in his day on really how easy is it for us as professors of everything that God has done to get rid of our wives at the earliest possible convenience, right? When they get old or they gain weight or because they burnt my toast, right? This is really what they're asking. And there were two camps that were going at it with each other. And Jesus simply says this, divorce is the last possible option that you should take. He does give he does give the reason of marital unfaithfulness as a reason or a, a cause that could potentially break that trust of oneness, right? And I've thought about that in today's world. 72% of Orange County is the divorce rate. I don't know what the Christian church is in Orange County, but in Orange County, every single marriage that gets to status of marriage has a 72% chance of failure. All you have to do is Google that, and I encourage you to do so. I know you probably will any, anyways. Is Jordan telling the truth? That's what all of the divorce sites say in Orange County. 72% is crazy high. And the reasons are varied, right? I was looking at one site that said 75% cite lack of commitment, 59% infidelity, uh, 57% too much conflict and arguing, maybe they married too young, financial problems, substance abuse, domestic violence, and all sorts of reasons, all sorts of reasons are listed as potentially derailing that oneness that God intended for us. But Jesus is so clear here that while divorce is a very real possibility, it should be looked at as the very last option. While marriage requires commitment, sex requires commitment, kids require commitment, all the things that happen as a result of oneness, of two lives coming together, divorce also requires commitment. A commitment to take Jesus slowly. Now, if that number is realistic, I know that all of us in some way, shape, or form have been impacted by divorce. So I want to be very careful what I say here. Sometimes we think that if we have sinned or made a mistake or done something that we regret, that it will impact God's love for us. And nothing could be further from the truth. Romans 8 makes it so clear that your decisions don't change how much God loves you. Your decisions shouldn't change how much the church loves you and wants to support you. And my greatest desire for our church is that we can be a place where people who are broken, even in their sexuality, can come to the table of Jesus and learn what it means to experience the faithfulness of God. Because all of us, have screwed up in some way, shape, or form. I think sometimes we judge people who have gotten divorced, right? Because, hey, I'm still married, so I wonder what happened to them. But you know how Jesus defines lust? He says, it starts in your head. If you have lusted even once in your head, your wife or your husband actually has a reason to get a divorce, according to Jesus. That's his teaching in Matthew 5, that lust starts in the heart. Now, you might say, well, it was never consummated. But Jesus says, sin is sin. I mean, I'm just bringing perspective. We, we judge people who get divorced. And why is that when we won't judge ourselves for having impure thoughts, lustful thoughts that lead to the splintering of a relationship that was supposed to be one? And here's what I'm hoping this teaching does is it creates a level playing field where in humility, we all come to the table and say, Jesus, we need help. We just need help. Show us how to have stronger marriages. You can't have a strong marriage without Jesus intervening somehow because only he has been purely faithful in your life without any manipulation, without any sin, without any uh, uh, leading it over you or influencing it over you. And he also says something about singleness. When I was single, I never focused on this passage. <laughs> His disciples respond, so maybe it's better not to get married since it seems so difficult to get a divorce, right? That's what they say to Jesus. And Jesus lists the reasons for singleness. He, say, he says some people are single from birth, right? They may not have a desire or maybe their desire doesn't line up with God's creation and they're, birth, they're single from birth. They, they could be single from the environment, right? Maybe, maybe they have been so influenced by the way their sexuality has been conditioned that they don't have a desire 
for marriage, if, if they want to honor God with their sexuality and with their relationship status, or that Jesus gives the best uh, opportunity. And either of these can become this if we choose. That there are some people who, in, uh, it, they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily uh, single from birth, um, or a, a eunuch, as he says, uh, from birth or from the environment, but they choose. They make a willful decision. And it is because of a desire to focus on the kingdom. Now, each of these statuses require commitment, right? Marriage requires commitment. It requires commitment because the people that are a part of that marriage need to know that the other person isn't just going to give up on them because of a flat tire, right? You, you've got to know that. That's why the vows in a marriage ceremony are so important. They're not just words, but they are requiring a response for the rest of one's life. And I know almost everybody I know has broken their vows in some way, shape, or form, right? I mean, it's, it's actually not that difficult to break a wedding vow, right? If Jesus' teaching is true, that a single lustful thought is sin. And I'm here to tell you it is because Jesus says that. So how, how do we get to that place where the commitment in our heart is something that can carry us through? Man, if there's one thing and I don't, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't know where this comes from, but I feel it. 72% of marriages end in divorce. And, I, and I, I've been thinking about this and praying about this for five years. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because we have money and we have options, if it's because we haven't fully understood what marriage is before we get married. I don't know if it's because um, we're just selfish. I don't know if it's because, you know, truly we've allowed our hearts to wander. I don't know what it is, but I do know that in Orange County, this is higher than in the rest of the country. And I feel like we need to make a decision whether or not we are married divorced, remarried, single, or somewhere in between, widowed, that we are going to commit ourselves to the idea of commitment itself. The vow of being faithful regardless of what happens. The vow of being faithful regardless of what happens. If you're single, if you're divorced, if you're married, if you're remarried, if you're widowed, if you're sexually active outside of marriage, if, you, if you've been a sexually abused, if you've been a sexual abuser, this is what I want you to hear so clearly. God loves you. And part of the reason we experience the pain and the brokenness of these relationships is because we haven't defined a relationship as God defines it, and we haven't depended on the Holy Spirit to live out that definition in our life in grace and power. We run when things get hard. I heard a joke just the other day about marriage, and it made me chuckle. Marriage is like a three-ring circus. The engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. And we've all been there. We've all had a flat tire, man. There have been things that have gotten in the way of what God desired. But instead of throwing Jesus' words out and our marriage out, what if we held Jesus' words higher and decided to, even when we don't feel it, to hold on to that thing, that relationship, that marriage, those kids, that whatever it is that God's called us to, and just we don't let go. What if we recognized that the decisions that we make today will create our healthy tomorrow? Pastor Glenn or Glenn Rowell sent me a quote from a book that wasn't on marriage. <laughs> And I read it and I thought, that is so good. It's actually a book from Letters from a Skeptic. I think it's significant because the whole book is about reflecting God, essentially. And sometimes we choose to have beliefs about God based on our experiences with people. It's very common, right? The number one 
grief with the church is that they're a bunch of hypocrites, right? Like, because our beliefs don't always line up with what we do. The quote says this, So it is, I believe, in every area of our lives. The more we choose something, the harder it is to choose otherwise. Until we are finally one solidified, eternalized in our decision, the momentum of our character becomes unstoppable. We create our character with our decisions, and our character in turn exercises more and more influence on the decisions we make. It is the nature of free, created beings, and I do not see how it could be otherwise. Life, I guess, is a lot like the proverbial snowball rolling down the hill. What applies to evil also applies to love. There was a time when I had to choose to love Shelley, and there was a very good possibility that I would choose not to love her and vice versa. It was, as it were, a probation period, call it courting. But with each choice we made for love, the less choice for love we had to make. The less the possibility of not loving was present. And now, though my love for her is yet free chosen, it is really is a part of my nature. And the snowball keeps on rolling. What if part of staying married was just recommitting or committing ourselves to the idea of commitment to love, to Jesus, to God's highest ideals, and that then would begin to shape the decisions that come after that? This is how most marriages start. They stand before two people, and super grateful we've got a couple, we've got actually a couple people in our, in our midst this morning that are newlyweds this year, but a couple that are really newlyweds, Ket and Alex, let's just give it up for them. Big congratulations. I saw them today and they just got back from their honeymoon and um, I tried to make it as awkward as possible, but all marriages start out with two people coming together and at some point they share their vows to each other. And I brought uh, something that my wife made. I wish I did it, but I clearly married up. And it's a, you know, just a photo mirage thing of different photos. And then our vows. And um, I wanted to bring it to you because I wanted to actually read Tara's vows to me, to you, today. Just as a homework exercise. So I had to soften you up to get you to do what I'm about to ask you to do. This is what she said on February 22nd, 2014. Jordan Paul Hansen. I'm not trying to do this, okay? I'm just going to do this. I have prayed for you long before I ever knew you. You were often on my heart. It is clear that God has brought us together. As I stand here today, I commit the rest of my life to you. Let's go on this journey called Life Together. When there are times of pain, I promise I promise to seek God with you. When there are times of joy, I promise to laugh with you. I promise to find contentment when we have a lot and when we have little. I promise to pray for you and lift you up daily. I promise to encourage you in every challenge you face. I promise to make our home a place of refuge, a safe place where you can be renewed. I promise to be devoted to you only and to keep our marriage bed holy. I am thankful that you chose me to be your partner in life. I can't wait to face this world with you by my side. You make me want to be a better person. You challenge me to grow in the areas that I, I am weak. You inspire me with your love and passion for the Lord. Thank you for loving me despite my flaws. I am thankful for all that we have been through and all that we will go through. May we find an adventure in every circumstance. This is just the beginning of our story. So today, I covenant with you before God to keep myself only for you as long as we both shall live. Yeah. I don't give homework assignments very often, but I am in this series. If you've been married in the last couple years, I want you, to, um, if you have them, to find your vows. And I want you to take your spouse on a date. And I want... I want you to reread those vows to them. Now, you may not have them. That's even better. Because I want you to rewrite them. I want every marriage... This is... Listen, we're not a cult. If you decide not to do this, you don't have to. <laughs> so, every week I get up here and I say, do this, do that, or God say it. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're a bunch of cats, right? I can't hurt you to do anything if God isn't doing it in you. 
But if you feel something in your heart, if you sense that God would have you do this, and really there's, there's no hurt or harm in it, it'll just help you. I would love for you to re- rewrite your vows for each other. And, or maybe add to them. A couple of years ago, I did a, a vow renewal ceremony for a couple that had gone through a hard time. And the husband asked me, he said, do you really want me to redo my vows or, or write my own vows? And I won't give his name, but I said, yes. And he wasn't the type of person that really was a writer, but he took me to heart and he went to a Starbucks by himself, spent a couple hours and rewrote those vows. And on the day that we did that vow renewal, he had his vows and then he like undid the paper and they dropped like down to here (laughs) because it was such a powerful experience for him. I'm telling you, there was not a dry eye in the room and the person that mattered most, the one that was looking at him, was just weeping. What if we revisited the covenant that we made before God with each other? That's the homework assignment for you married couples. For you singles, you're not off the hook. Some of you may be single because, again, from birth or because of choosing or because maybe there's just not someone available at this point in your life, but you believe that God could have marriage for you someday. What would your life look like if you wrote out your vows to them now? And you actually lived as if you were married now. That these things that you could see yourself eventually committing to someone else could become the standard of the culture that you're trying to cultivate right now. And if that is not something that you ever desire, if you take Jesus' words to heart and you say, I, I actually want to be the third, what if, what if you wrote a vow or, or, or a, a, a paragraph or a page of what you want the rest of your life to look like? as a committed follower of Jesus? What would, that, what would a covenant look like for you? I believe that commitment, the commitment that we show towards Christ, towards the church, <laughs> towards our spouses, towards our kids, is so different than anything in our culture that when they, people see it who don't know God, they won't, they won't be able to understand it outside of relationship with him. It would help them understand something that we ourselves already know. Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion on the day of Jesus Christ. That we are able to define marriage and then depend on God to live that out because God has always been faithful to us. And he isn't stopping. He will be faithful to us. I heard uh, an older person say, we were born at a time where if something was broken, we'd fix it, not throw it away. And what if we as followers of Christ commit and recommit to commitment because we know that even when the feelings flee, God hasn't left. He's still there. And disciples are with Jesus. Just following him. Doing what he did saying what he said, and being committed to the things that he is committed to. I'm convinced that Jesus is committed to you. There's nothing that you could do, say, or, or act out in this world that would cause him to, to back away from you. He loves you. He's so committed. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you so that the things that keep you from that level of commitment can actually eventually die as you surrender those things to the Lord. Would you stand up with me? If you've never committed your hearts to Christ, this would be the beginning, the starting point to this journey with Jesus that we are all at a different place with. And regardless of where you are in your relationships, you need the power of God for forgiveness, for empowerment, to live out this crazy journey of relationship status, singleness, divorced, remarried, widowed, happily married, unhappily married, wherever you are in that field. Father, we commit our hearts to you because we know that when you have our hearts, you truly have everything else. Father, it's not easy to live out the things that can be difficult. And yeah, there is pain in marriage. And we say things that are stupid to each other and 
and that hurt each other. And Lord, the vulnerability of marriage is undeniable, but it also creates, it also creates so much opportunity for hurt because we've trusted each other with our hearts. Lord, remind us that we've trusted you with our hearts and that you have been faithful. And that if we'll continue to trust you with our hearts, you will be faithful to finish the good work in us that you started. So Jesus, we commit to you today. We recommit to you. We ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would empower us. And Father, we pray that you would help us follow you all the rest of of our lives from this day forward until the very end jesus we worship you